meeting, end of the meeting, there's no good time. You know, in the morning, everybody's tired. Some of you are hungover. End of the talk, everybody's kind of tired. Some of you are hungover. So here we are now. Um, good morning and thank you. So what I'd like to talk about today is really, I think, well encapsulated in the title of the talk, The Ascent of Adult ECMO. As many of you know, I would imagine all of you have had a lot or some experience in ECMO programs, uh, adult or pediatric. And what's been interesting as I've come to become a little bit more knowledgeable in the subject is that the majority of the growth in ECMO has come through small programs, about 80% of the growth. And we're trying to understand, is that a good idea? How do we select programs? And then what kind of determinants of success do we try to uh, maintain to make sure that we have some type of success and we're taking good care of our patients? So first off, I'll tell you a little bit uh, about where I come from and what hospital system I represent. Um, as Susan pointed out earlier, we used to be called Florida Hospital System, which was kind of confusing because all the hospitals are in Florida. And you say, well, why is that Florida Hospital System? But actually, we're, we're part of Adventist Healthcare. And now all of the hospitals have been rebranded as recently as the beginning of this year, and we are now the Advent Health System. It's a pretty big healthcare system, for those of you that are not familiar with it. Um, 47 hospitals founded in 1908. Um, we cover 10 states. Uh, about half of the hospitals or more are based in Florida, mostly in central Florida. Though we have hospitals that are in Georgia, all the way out to Texas, um, Mississippi, and so forth. Uh, it's a big company, 80,000 employees. And that's really just the East Coast part of the operation. In the next two or three years, we will actually uh, again merge with the West Coast operation. For those of you that might be coming or listening from the West Coast, and East Coast is called Advent Health. West Coast is called Adventist Health. And when those two corporations are merged, it'll be a company of about 75 hospitals and about 120,000 employees. So that is just the breadth of what we do. In the Orlando area, which is where our main hospital is, it's a 1,300-bed um, tertiary care hospital that performs everything from routine bypass surgery to heart-lung transplantation and mechanical circulatory support. That's about a 1,300-bed hospital, and that's about 40 or so miles due south uh, of the program uh, that I started back in uh, 2010. If you look at the aggregate of how many heart surgeries get performed in this system, it's about 3,600 heart surgeries a year. So it's pretty robust. You know, even in the year 2019, 3,600 heart surgeries count, and it matters. So the next question becomes, you know, why would we have an ECMO program in a community hospital? Uh, how many of you, by show of hands, work in community hospitals versus major medical centers? So it seems about half, or maybe even the majority. Um, if you take a look at the initial rollout for ECMO, that was only in tertiary care centers, quaternary care centers, you know, in many cases. So someone had mentioned, I think the previous speaker had mentioned about the inspiration of it all. So the first question is, you know, why would you even start a heart surgery program? And I could tell you, when I got there about eight or nine years ago, I thought, well, this is no big deal. This is like teaching everybody a new language. And then you get on the ground and you realize how elemental it is, and you come to realize it's not like teaching them a new language, it's like teaching them a new alphabet. You know, that is how fundamental it is. So as we achieved some success in the program and started to do heart surgeries and the number of pretty close to 400 heart surgeries a year, and we thought that that was a respectable volume that might support the next level of care, whether it was mechanical circulatory support in the way of things like Impella or things like ECMO, which we'll talk a little bit more about we come forward. Um, it's about inspiration and it's about a story. And we started to realize that we were perhaps not just in the heart surgery space, but in the critical care space, we were losing patients that perhaps we may not have been, uh, should have not been losing otherwise. And then there's always a story, right? As adults, we come to learn better by stories than just by reading textbooks. So here's a story that I experienced. There was a fella in the uh, hospital, uh, his name was James Roberts. It was kind of the guy that we all have these relationships at work. You kind of know this person. Maybe you'll see him, you know, or her a couple of times a day or a couple of times a week. You never really get to know who they are. You just kind of nod, how's your day? You're in the elevator, that kind of thing. And James worked for a uh, physical plant. So he was the guy that fixed things in the hospital. And then one day I'm on call and I get a call and we have a patient and it's a STEMI patient. Guy had arrested uh, in the hospital and needed emergency bypass surgery. And I come to find that it's this guy, you know, it's James Roberts. And we go ahead and we fix him and we do bypass surgery. But as part of his injury, he had aspirated, had a major aspiration. And over the next couple of days, and you can probably tell how the story ends, his aspiration gets worse, he goes into ARDS. We don't have the ability to transfer him out because our hospital, our transfer center hospital down in Orlando is full. And lo and behold, you know, James winds up dying. And that was kind of hard because we thought, well, maybe if we had this level of support, you know, maybe he would not have died. 
So I felt personally responsible for that. I thought perhaps I should have pushed a little bit earlier, you know, and rethought whether we should have had this program earlier. It's not quite so simple, as you know. It's not like you snap your fingers and a program appears. Um, it requires a lot of work and commitment, and we'll talk through that in a bit. But what made it worse and what made it uh, really a personal journey for me is I came to learn that his daughter also worked in the hospital, right? And she also worked in physical plant housekeeping. So I see her now about every day. You know, so you think about these personal reminders, you know, and these inspirational stories about why we need to try to advance certain levels of care. You know, that was my personal professional journey of where we're at. So why? You know, why community-based ECMO? It starts with outcomes, right? You have to have good outcomes, right? We cannot offer a service or a technology that produces anything less than excellent outcomes. So I put uh, provides outcomes that are as good or equal to tertiary centers with an asterisk. And the reason I put the asterisk is it has to be for like cases, right? It has to be for apples and apples comparison. And in order to do that, you have to have a certain amount of what I call intellectual humbleness. I used to think it was intellectual honesty. I used to think, well, that meant, you know, you need to be really honest and you need to peel away the layers of whatever your ego or bravado is and you need to take a look at your data and you need to accept it for what it is. So when someone challenges you with, you know, how are your results, of course you give the answer, well, they're excellent and here they are. And then I've kind of evolved that to it needs to really be intellectual humbleness because there's stuff that you think you know, and if you put it down on a, an exam, you would think you were given the 100% accurate answer, but there's stuff that you don't know, and you really need to have a plural group take a look at this. So outcomes, of course, are very important. Um, why does it matter? You know, why don't we just transfer all these patients out, right? How many of you have been part as a receiving institution or as a transferring institution, and the phrase goes like this, we'll just transfer them out. It's no big deal. Right, but then you don't think about the impact. And as I have gained more you know, gray hair in the middle years of my career, you think, well, what does that really mean? Now think about it. If you have somebody who's in your community hospital and you're able to provide this level of care, but now you have to ship them out or transfer them out and they go 45 minutes away, two hours away, you know, what do you think that does to their isolation? You know, do you think that their family sees them as much? Do you think there's not a stress to the patient or the family? So I think there is a community commitment to take a look at these type of technologies and understand whether they apply. Um, there's a little bit of the institutional mission. What is the mission of your hospital? Provide the best possible care. That's usually what they mean. But you know, what does that actually mean? Is the best possible care all the way through heart-lung transplantation? Is it VV ECMO? Is it Impella? Is it none of those things? Is it balloon pumps? There's something called the halo effect, right? We're all familiar with that. Um, if you get this, then something else good will happen. Well, the halo effect is actually kind of a dumbed-down version of what we call the Matthew effect, which is the effect of accumulated advantages. And all that really means is the more better things that you could do in an institution, the better everything else gets around that institution. Because you focus on the outcomes, you have certain technologies that bring other expertise with it. You have a certain amount of institutional pride. I could tell you an hour system. Specifically, the CVIC nurses, the CVOR team, you know, which helps us uh, cannulate our patients, they really connect with the patients in a different way because these are special patients. These are high resource, super sick patients that when we institute, you know, the ECMO uh, care for them, they tend to really connect with that and it, it buzzes within the hospital. Uh, transportation risk. We made the comment earlier about no big deal, we'll just transport the patient. It's a really big deal to transport ECMO level patients. Some of them are not transportable, some of them are too sick if you wait too long to transfer them. Um, for those of you that have had the experience of packing somebody into a helicopter, you know, with a cardio help, for example, you know, it's not that easy and it doesn't come with zero risk. Uh, especially when you live in Florida, you just think, well, it's a sunshine state, we'll transfer them any day or any time of night. Except if it's hurricane season or if it's bad weather, right, which happens, it seems, all the time when people are sick. Other opportunities to discuss and think about are technology diffusion. Uh, 30 years ago, you know, if you had a balloon pump, that was pretty high tech. And the idea of moving that out of a tertiary center into a community hospital was kind of crazy talk, you know. So at what point do these levels of technology become safe enough, reproducible enough, where we could do them in other settings and it makes sense? Access and overflow. I'd made the comment earlier about transportation risk. What I was referring to then was the actual risk of actually transporting somebody. But then there's also just because you want to transfer someone doesn't mean that there's somebody available to take the patient. We work in a large clinically integrated network system, so when we transfer our patients, it's within the system. So everything, the gravity flows towards Advent Health Orlando, which is a large hospital that we talked about. Um, what happens when they're at capacity, which believe it or not happens not infrequently, whether it's with the ECMO program or mechanical circulatory support or the hospital in general? 
then you're stuck holding on to a patient that perhaps you don't want to or isn't best for the patient. And then last issues are financial. Is this something that we make money with? Is this cost neutral? Is this something we lose money with? And if we don't make money with it, is it still something that fits within the institutional mission? Uh, the hospital system I work in is a not-for-profit. So not-for-profit doesn't mean not-profit. It just means how do you address that and what's the community benefit when we take care of these patients? So we'll talk a little bit about determinants of success, and this is whether it's an ECMO program or really nothing different than starting any type of program. Um, and there's four kind of inputs and one output. Institutional commitment uh, for any of you that have been part of starting anything new in any system. You really have to have the institutional commitment to get it done. And at some point, that means one of your physician leaders or whoever the team leaders are need to get in front of usually the CEO or it could be the CMO or the COO, but it's one of the O's, and you really have to have that very frank discussion of that this is what it's going to take to make this program successful. We always focus on the economics, which is actually the easiest part. Anytime it's a question of writing a check, you know, that actually is the easiest part. That's the low bar. The high bar are the other parts that we talk about. It's about key personnel, physician leaders, and so forth. Just because you have the technology, right, and if you talk to the industry people, you know, the story goes like this, you know, we sold so-and-so system a thing, and the thing showed up, and then it just sat there. Robots, ECMO circuits, you know, you can go on and on. So you have to have actually the vision, and you have to have the team collaboration and the key personnel to do that. Key personnel is really along all forms of the system. It are the physicians who will cannulate and perhaps be captains of the ship. It are the perfusionists who know the most about the devices. All right? I don't even know how to turn that machine on. You know, um, and, and fortunately, that's bad. And uh, fortunately, um, you know, our system is uh, perfusionist driven and it provides us the best possible quality of care and also great educational sources. And then you need leaders. You need people that are gonna continue to carry the flag and drive the process forward because there will be people that want to see you fail, right? Every time there's a new anything, you will get up there and you will have results that perhaps are not perfect and, oh, you shouldn't be doing this program. Why are you doing this? It's much easier not to do it. Um, you know, transfer everything out. And then in the end, you have to have good patient selection process, right? We have all, unfortunately, uh, if you've been in the practice of heart surgery for any period of time, we've all been in this really uncomfortable situation where a case starts, everybody looks at the patient, whether it's the chart or the condition or uh, whatever lab value, and you get this bad feeling in your stomach, right? And you think, man, we should not be doing this case, right? I would imagine all of you have had that experience uh, and probably have had it regularly, more regularly than we should. And that's an issue of patient selection, right? Um, there's a lot of ways to get to patient selection. It's still certainly more of an art than a, a science, but there are some quantitative guidance models that we'll talk about, and there are some ways to limit variability on how we select our patients. And this is not to say that we don't want to do sick patients, that we don't want to take care of complicated patients. We just don't want to take care of futile patients, right? Because there's nothing less gratifying than putting people through a bunch of intervention and then three or four days later, you find out, well, this was a really bad idea. We should have never done this, and now we're talking about withdrawal, right? It is really not good for the system. It is not the way that macro healthcare is going as we head more towards population health and really take a look, not just at outcomes, not just that someone lived 30 days, but meaningful outcomes. They lived 30 days, and at some point, they were able to, you know, maintain some activities of daily living. And then outcomes review, and you'll hear that as a common theme, you know, certainly within our program. I think heart surgery specifically has always been in the forefront of taking a look at outcomes. STS data reporting has been very good for more than 30 years, um, and I think we have applied, at least in our situation, and I would uh, strongly recommend for the programs that you guys go back and try to improve, to take a, a really good look at data, uh, which includes outcomes, and outcomes not just measured by mortality, but outcomes measured by length of stay. Some of them could be financial metrics. Um, some of them uh, could be qualitative metrics. So just uh, very briefly taking a look at, you know, how has ECMO gone um, nationally? You can see here, and this is uh, just right out of the uh, ELSO website, and this is about a 16 or 17 year um, chart that describes both the number of centers and the number of ECMO programs. So it's kind of interesting. You can kind of see, you know, for a number of years it was relatively flat, um, and then starting about six or seven years ago, you see a kind of a significant growth. And then interestingly, in this last year or two, and the data is actually quite relevant, it's uh, 2018 data is that last slide, it's kind of flattened off, 
right? Maybe even dropped a little bit. So if you look at it more granularly, what that means is there's roughly 215 centers, you know, that are performing ECMO. And last year they did about 6,600 runs of ECMO. So you do the math, that's about 30 per center. And somebody would say, well, that's not so bad, you know, 30 per center, that seems like it's a reasonable amount of volume. But we know that's not the way it works, right? Because we know that it's what we call asymmetry. It's not 200 centers all doing 30 cases. The majority of the growth in ECMO over the last five years have been in low volume centers. Low volume centers as defined by six or less cases a year. Most of us don't get a warm, fuzzy feeling when we say we are in a center that does six of something a year. Does that mean that the results are good? How do you maintain clinical competency? Uh, what are the financial aspects of it? But that, frankly, is where the growth has occurred. And we don't know where this curve will be in the next two or three years. Will it completely flatten out? Will the economics change now that reimbursement has changed for percutaneous ECMO? Or will we continue to see good results? And uh, how will we measure good results? What will the payers do as far as ECMO? Just taking another look at um, more uh, data also off the ELSA website. And this is a five-year running total of uh, ECMO numbers. And you can see the breakdown between neonatal, pediatric, and adult. Obviously, in our institution, we focus on adult only. And then you can further see the distribution between pulmonary, cardiac, and eCPR, which is kind of interesting and has become popular over the last few years. Take a look at outcomes. You know, the first row of outcomes talks about survived eCLS. Well, that's good. I mean, you want them to survive the therapy that you're instituting, but that really is kind of the low bar, right? They survived. It's like saying you've just done a routine heart surgery and they survive cardiopulmonary bypass. You know, the expectation is they're going to survive pulmonary bypass. You know, the expectation is when you're flying in an airplane, which is maybe not good historically right now, but the plane is going to land and it's going to function okay. More meaningfully, then you get to survive to discharge or transfer, right? Then it becomes a little bit more clinically relevant. So survive to discharge or transfer. Transfer, I think, is still a low bar, right? So transfer perhaps might just mean is that you've instituted someone on an ECMO, whether it's VV or VA, and then you've called for transfer, and they have made it to the transfer center. Also not an especially good high bar, right? Because you don't know what the outcome of that patient is. It becomes more meaningful, and the data here is still a little bit muddy because they've grouped them together, either survive to discharge or transfer. So I think more meaningfully as we go forward, we need to get to things like STS data reporting where it's 30 day survival and then even better than that taking a look at meaningful survival, right? Because for many of us who are not in a very multidisciplinary system, we're not really connected with the long term outcomes of the patient. And it's kind of interesting and I'm sure you guys have had this experience. Um, somebody will ask about surgeon results and you go, oh, surgeon A, B or C, you know, how do they do? And you're limited to what happens in the operating room, right? But you don't know what the 30 day results are or you don't know necessarily what their complications are. And I think we need to be thinking in terms of that as we take a look at our ECMO patients for patient selection. Our indications um, in our system are here described. Um, the majority of our patients actually were aspiration patients, but we have a relatively equal distribution of bacterial pneumonia, viral pneumonia, and we have some of the cardiac patients. Not that exciting. Patient selection. Uh, patient selection is really probably the key to good results. You know, we think about which device we use, we get super focused on minutia about what our flow rate should be. Should it be three and a half liters, 4.2 liters? And we super focus on that and we think, well, that must be the success. You know, the programs that run at this rate have better success than the programs run at that rate. But the reality is, is the programs who pick the best patients do the best, right? And that may seem obvious, but actually it's not obvious because how do you get there? And this is true whether we're thinking about ECMO patients or we're thinking about any type of surgery patients. Um, I will tell you, multidisciplinary collaboration, which was also cited in more than one of the previous speakers, it is absolutely key, right? You have one person looking at one set of data. They have a certain bias that they come with, right? Whether it's bias of experience uh, by how many years they've been in practice, bias by how much they've had experience in circulatory support, um, bias by how things are going in their life, right? So the more people you can get involved in the process, what does that mean? Surgical side in our system, critical care side, sometimes it's the patient's cardiologist, it's a cardiology patient, our perfusion colleagues, um, and again, really important to have that discussion before you make a recommendation for patients to go on uh, ECMO. Quantitative guidance, that's kind of a cool phrase. Um, how many of you do you know use something like the RESP score? 
That sound familiar to anybody? See, it's interesting, right? Because if you are in the I'm trying to decide who's on ECMO, it is really a pretty relevant piece of data, right? So the REST score, which you can find online, is very easy to use, and I would encourage you guys to go back to your practices and take a look at it and just kind of do it at least on your own um, as you're thinking about how this is going to turn out. So you can take a look on the right, and it's a pretty simple system to use. It, it takes, I don't know, not more than 15 seconds. And factors like patient age, ARDS, have they had a cardiac arrest, what's their AA gradient, do they have multi-organ failure, um, all the things that you kind of would like to know, right? And you can see now, based on the slope of that curve, it'll tell you what the success rate, what is the uh, prospective survivability of that. And it's interesting because what do you do with that data, right? So what if you do your RESP score on a patient who you think is a VV uh, ECMO candidate and it comes back 20% likelihood of survival? Do you put that patient on? 80% survival? Do you put that patient on? So these are not absolute guidance. These are tools, right? These are tools that tell you this is going to turn out probably pretty well or this is not going to turn out very well. I can tell you in my experience, Age is so important. I don't know how many of you have been part of putting quote unquote old people, you know, on ECMO. I could tell you that the curve and the data support very much once you get to about age 60, right, the data really changes in a negative way about outcomes of patients. That doesn't mean you shouldn't put someone on who's 60 or 65, but you can't get away from this data. And historical thinking, and physicians have been worst at this, is nobody wants to lose autonomy. Nobody wants to use bundled orders or quantitative guidance to make decisions because we feel like we know better. We feel like we have some exceptionalism that our experience tells us that we can make better selections on who to choose for patients. But every piece of data that studied that, and it's called clinical versus analytical decision making, tells us the opposite. Right? You cannot get away from the numbers. And just because you have this one time, this one cool thing happened, and we saved this one patient that everybody thought was going to die, that is not a really good way to run a practice or run a business because you're going to wind up wasting a huge amount of resources for all the people where it didn't work out so well. So how else do we make patient selection? Chest x-rays. Uh, of course, we look at chest x-rays every day. They tend to be more of a lagging indicator right, than a forward indicator, but they're important. Uh, ABG, specifically AA gradients, are important. Once your gradients start to get above 300, that is really at least a dark yellow flashing light, if not a red flashing light. Cardiovascular collapse in the sense of uh, VA patients, uh, and I don't mean people you know, who work for the Veterans Administration patients, I mean VA ECMO patients. Uh, trending and timing is, is perhaps one of the most uh, artistic parts of it. Right? Somebody has one bad blood gas or one chest or that looks terrible. Is that an ECMO patient? You know, our methodology has been more trending, right? So you have to have a trend. One point does not a trend make. Two points, in my opinion, does not a trend make. You usually need about three points, right? You need to kind of see that the patient's on maximum ventilatory support, whatever that means in your institution, PEEP above 10, FiO2 of 100, uh, peak airway pressure is above 35, 40, you know, pick a number, and they are not improving. Uh, I think you'll hear this not just from ECMO programs, but from mechanical circulatory support programs, which tend to be very closely aligned, is that early intervention tends to lead to better outcomes, right? Because once patients have started to have significant barotrauma, oxygen toxicity, multi-organ failure, of course their path to recovery is going to be more difficult. On the other hand, you have to weigh that against, we don't want to put everybody with a cold on ECMO. You know, our results will be better, but we'll also have an overutilization of resources. So it's very artistic. It's also very important that you have a collaboration with the people that will be taking care of the patients. I kind of like this one, ECMO term limits. You know, so what does that mean? Historically, physicians specifically, were very good about having patient control of care. So what does that mean? Somebody who's critically ill, and they would interact with the family, maybe the patient if they were in a position they can communicate and say, look, we're going to try this therapy, whatever it is, for a day, three days, and if it doesn't work out, we're going to withdraw this therapy, and that's going to be the way it is. And then somewhere along the line, I think partly because we've got so much great technology and the expectations of the community have changed to where we can save everybody, that that didn't happen. And I had a comment with uh, Gilbert, one of our perfusions, before I walked in here, and we talked about feudal care, right? And all of us have been, unfortunately, accomplices of futile care. It is not a good feeling. It's not good for the system. So what do echo term limits mean? So in our institution, when we have a very clear, transparent, frank discussion with the patient's families, because all of our ECMO patients, they're all intubated and critically ill, I think most of them would be, is that we will have a f conversation that will go something like this. 
we were going to try ECMO for about a week. And I usually use week as my first metric. It's kind of hard to sort things out before that, certainly for the VV patients. We're going to try it for about a week. And if we do not see signs of success, we're going to withdraw ECMO. And we completely take them out of that part of the equation. They don't get to be decision makers in that part of the equation because otherwise you live through the experience of no one dies on ECMO, right? Are they on for a day? Are they on for a week? Are they on until their 80th birthday? Um, and that has actually worked out pretty well um, because I think the patient's families appreciate a certain amount of ownership and leadership, you know, in that care and their guidance. So I just bring that to your attention. So again, we don't have wasted resources in the care of those patients. So then what happens? So you have met with your collaborative team. You have taken a look at your data points. You have trended them. You have realized that the patient continues to deteriorate, and we are concerned now that we are going to have a mortality or a bad outcome, or we're just going to continue to create barrow trauma, and perhaps they'll survive, but they'll survive in a weakened state. So then what do you do? Well, we have a system that is very similar to like a STEMI blast page, for those of you that are familiar with that. STEMI systems in most hospitals tend to work pretty well. You have a STEMI team. They are connected with the operator of the hospital or whatever your trigger mechanism is, and then the call goes out. We tried to do these in normal day working hours, which usually works out, because um, we try not to wait until the patient's imminently crashing. And then we send out the signal. Um, it doesn't look quite like the bad signal. It's not quite that cool. It's just a blast page on your pager, you know, or on your cell phone. But we start with that. So if you are in a low performing system, it looks like this. You know, it's a bunch of deer in the headlights like, well, what do we do? You know, oh, we gotta find so-and-so. Oh, where's Joe? I don't know, Joe, he's probably having wings at some bar. We'll find him, he'll get here in about an hour or two. No, that's not the way it works. It works like a STEMI system, right? People are on call for ECMO, the system is activated, and you show up just like you would show up in a STEMI you know, program. And we have already drilled through it, so we know how to do it. And when you get to a point where you're doing enough consistent cases, you don't have to worry about drilling for it quite so much. Um, but certainly in the programs that are low volume, that may make sense. If you're only doing a handful a year and you think that's the right business for your system to be in, then you probably should do ECMO drill cases just to make sure you have some fluency. If you're in a high performing system, at least in our system, uh, we use a cardio help system. Um, it is not perfect. It is not the only one. Some of you are probably familiar with it, but it's actually a pretty nice system for us. Um, it makes it very easy for transport. Our uh, referral hospital uses it so we can actually just send the patient with the device. The patient offloads to the new hospital, unplug, replug, bring the device back. Um, provides a, a huge amount of support and the systems have become automated enough, at least in our experience, where they're safe to use in our environment. Um, you can see here on the bottom uh, shows one of the Avalon catheters, which is our preferred method of cannulation for the VV ECMO patients. Uh, works out really well. Um, if you haven't seen a cannula live or a neck, this is what it looks like. You know, what could go wrong sticking a 31 French cannula into someone's neck? A lot could go wrong, right? And we won't go through the what goes wrong talk, but let me give you a little bit about guidance about how we do it, which I think is pretty standard or should be standard. Every single patient gets fluoroscopy right, for wire placement, and every single patient gets TEE in the operating room to make sure that we have uh, appropriate placement of the uh, cannula and we have appropriate jet flow going through the tricuspid valve. We didn't always used to do it this way, um, and a lot of higher performing, higher volume systems, and perhaps some of you are part of them, they will actually uh, cannulate in the ICU. Um, for us, we don't feel that that's quite safe enough, and when bad things happen, ICU is not a great place to be able to deal with them. So we'll talk a little bit about our actual patients and a little bit about our cohort characteristics. Um, you can see the patients are relatively young, uh, 54. Uh, our oldest patient that we put on was about 65 years old, and we had quite a few patients in their 30s. Uh, most of them tend to be male. Pre-ECMO length of stay. So how many days are the patients in the hospital before we institute ECMO? It's around four days with a pretty good variability, some of them five, six, seven days. So to me, as I look at this data, and this is why it's so important to get back to that idea about intellectual honesty, how do we improve? You know, and I look at this number, four days. Is that too long? It feels too long to me when we take a look at that. So we go back and we take a look at the data and we have we picked up on some of these subtle triggers about the trending of some of the data. Now, it's not that we hold on to these numbers absolutely. It's not like we have a watch and we go, well, oh, four days, you know, it's time to be on ECMO or not on ECMO. Um, but I think there's an opportunity to improve. And I think our next 10 patients, as we refine our patient selection methodology, it probably gets to more two, two and a half days, right? Patients that are deteriorating 
they don't tend to dip like this and then just all of a sudden get better on their own with conventional methods. Uh, BMI, 33 and a half, you know, they're robust. I don't know if that's big or small and where you guys come from, but uh, they're not small in our world. The rest score, we talked about that before, so about 2.4, also with some wide variability. So in 2.4, if you go back to the rest scale, that should probably give you around a 50% survivability. And that kind of gives you the intellectual humbleness of knowing how are we doing? You know, it's not enough just to say we saved one or two patients. If you do a cohort of 10 patients or 100 patients and your RESP scores, which are not perfect, but they're perhaps the best predictive model we have right now, would suggest 50% of your patients should survive and only 30% of your patients are surviving, you really need to look back and think about what you're doing. Is it technology? Is it process? Is it patient and selection? And then AA gradients are pretty substantial, as you can see. 377, I think we had uh, gradients that go up into the mid-500s. ECMO management, a uh, little bit of a busy slide. This is kind of the how we do it. Um, there's not one right way to do it, but I think there needs to be less unexplained variability in the way these things happen. For those of you that have worked in different hospitals, especially I had a chat with Susan before, especially for those of you that travel, right? It's really pretty interesting. You know, when you want to find out how a system functions, is it a high performing system? Is a surgeon good? You know, you'll have people ask the wrong people. You have doctors asking doctors, but they never actually see the other people operate. You should ask the perfusionists, right? How do you think Dr. Smith does? Well, I've seen 300 heart surgeons in the last three years, and I can tell you based on this cohort, so-and-so is pretty good or not so good, or they're good at this, but they're not very good at that, right? So I don't think that ECMO systems or ECMO, ECMO strategy, you know, should be very different. Um, how do we cannulate? For the VV ECMO patients, we talked about it. Uh, we use uh, central cannulation, well, we use peripheral cannulation that uh, goes centrally, and we use the Avalon catheter. Um, there's certainly nothing wrong with doing femoral femoral. It's a little bit more invasive. Um, it's pretty interesting. When I talk to some of my colleagues, the one-up colleagues, we all have them. Like, you tell them a story, and they one-up you, right? So the one-up colleagues, they talk about, well, you know, if you don't cannulate through the neck, then how are you going to get them up and walk, right, when they're on VV ECMO? Have you ever heard that story, right? So how many of you have been in systems where patients on VV ECMO regularly get up and walk? Okay, so about 2%, you know, 3%, right? Pretty rare, right? And those tend to be in the cystic fibrosic young patients who are 20 years old. You can do almost anything to them, and they'll do okay. So the reality is patients don't really get up and walk very much. We anticoagulate our patients. We use an ACT 180 to 200. Um, there's nothing magic about that. Uh, when we're getting ready to do procedures, we'll turn our anticoagulation off for usually two or three hours, depending on what procedure it is. Um, and we talked a little bit earlier about the multidisciplinary care team. We round as a multidisciplinary care team, which includes surgeons, critical care, perfusion, bedside nurse, respiratory therapy, when appropriate um, nutrition and pharmacy, three times a day on every single one of those patients, right? That is what you, I think you need to do to get it done right. Because little nuances change, right? And I'll share with you some bad outcome that we had uh, that perhaps we could have picked up on earlier. And you can't just round on them once a day and just high five each other and go, all right, that's our plan, you know, we'll touch base later and, and react to when something bad happens. You've really got to pick up on these trend lines, whether it's an increasing lactate level, increasing unexplained acidosis, change in pump flow, right? All these things matter. Um, sedation, how do you sedate the patients? We tend to not paralyze our patients, and they tend to be sedated with a combination of either propofol and fentanyl or uh, Presidex and, and fentanyl. It um, tends to work out really quite well. All of our patients get percutaneous tracheostomy. We do them all at the bedside in the ICU. If you are sick enough to be on echo, then you need a tracheostomy. And the reason that is, and I'll skip over, is that because we do daily bronchoscopy on everybody. If you're on VV ECMO, you're getting a bronchoscopy every day until you go through a period of two or three days where we don't get much return on our bronchoscopies and the x-rays have improved. It's incredible how when you look at certain x-rays, you think, well, there won't be very much to return from bronchoscopy. Yet there is, and you pull out nasty, terrible looking things that sometimes help your antibiotic guidance and at a minimum helps clear the airways. Um, kind of the mirror image of if you get a tracheostomy, you get a peg because we want to get early nutrition. Ventilator settings. I wasn't even sure I was going to put any numbers. I just kind of put some basic numbers, right? Um, ventilator settings, you could also have the same argument of how do you manage your perfusion settings or your cardio help settings. For us, this is our baseline start for an average patient. Tidal volume is relatively low, 300 feet was low at 5. FIO240. Um, it's really interesting, and again, I think you guys have probably had some of this experience of how little some of the peripheral people taking care of critical care patients understand the physiology of ECMO. 
One of the things that irks me, and I say irk because I don't want to use the, use the phrase pisses me off, but I will because I just did, is that when you come in the morning and the FIOT has been turned up to 100%, right? Has that ever happened to you? just drives you crazy. And then you go, why did this happen? And they'll go, well, you know, the patient hiccuped. Or we had a suction them, their pressure dropped to 80 for a minute. So we turned, you know, that's what we did. We bagged them and we FIOT them. <laughs> so what does that tell you? That tells you they don't understand, you know, the pathophysiology of what they're doing. So ECMO, among anything else, and our perfusionist specifically will tell you, it's an opportunity to educate, right? Because these things matter, right? High FIO2s cause oxygen toxicity over a period of time. Cardio help settings, what do you set the device at? You know, I'll defer that to our perfusionist. In general, we have a goal of running at around four liters a minute. You know, our, our venous pressures are around negative 100, 120 or so for sweeps are variable depending on the blood gases. When we decannulate the VV patients, uh, we decannulate them in the ICU and we haven't had any problems with that. Outcomes, this is what matters. So in our experience, um, our average runs have been around 10 days. I think our longest run so far has been about 22 days. Um, hospital length of stay, it's interesting, it's only around 25 days. So for our patients, however we have been selecting them and whatever our referral patterns are, you know, they're not in the hospital that much longer than they are after ECMO. So we tend to have what I would consider very good recovery of the patients. Uh, we do have a lot of acute renal failure. Almost everybody goes into renal failure. You can pretty much guarantee that, at least in our system. Um, we tend to uh, use a lot of CRT, and we tend to use a lot of that, you know, through the ECMO circuit. Interestingly, happily to report, we haven't had any device failures or any malfunctions. Also, we have not had any uh, major bleeding with our anticoagulation strategy. Minor bleeding, sure, all the time. Somewhere around the tracheostomy site, perhaps, sometimes around central lines, uh, but nothing to where I think we've even had to ever stop the uh, anticoagulation. Um, how many survived ECLS? Uh, the great majority of them. I will uh, share with you our one patient that didn't survive. And this is a difficult case for us. In fact, this was our last patient. It was a 60-year-old fella riding his bicycle. Apparently, riding your bike is not really healthy or safe. And he comes to the emergency room not feeling well. He has a cardiac arrest, has an eight-minute arrest the first time, has a STEMI, gets stented, recovers, has another arrest, gets recathed, recovers. Um, so we were never really sure what his neurologic recovery would have been. But organically, we thought he was a good recovery candidate and otherwise a very healthy fella. And he wound up actually having a very severe aspiration. And uh, he wound up dying around ECMO day 10. And our best estimate is that he probably died from ischemic gut because he had actually been doing quite well. And it was very disappointing to have the conversation with the family in the morning about, you know, your dad is doing pretty well and you know, this is our expectation. And then about 10 hours later saying, well, he's not doing so well. You know, he's become wildly acidotic, can't find another explanation. Um, I hate to use that as an excuse, you know, why patients don't do well, and we say, well, it's just ischemic gut, uh, but sometimes you don't have a better answer for it. Um, survived to uh, discharge or transfer, the great majority of ours did, 30-day survival. Um, so in our cohort of 10 patients so far, eight of them were VV ECMOs, two of them were VA ECMOs. Our VA ECMO patients do not do well. Uh, we got our patients over to a referral center, and some of them uh, went on to intermediate term BADS, uh, the two patients that we sent over actually didn't survive. Um, so we are not trying to be a VA ECMO program. We're trying to understand our sweet spot in VV, and I think we've done pretty well. Of the first eight, seven have survived and have had meaningful survival. So going forward, what are our programmatic goals? Quality outcomes. Can't have a sentence or a slide that doesn't have that. Uh, we continue to have a very robust database. We take a look at our data with every patient, and every time that there is a bad outcome, we have a uh, root cause analysis review, and we talk about things that we could have done differently and uh, things that we might do differently in the future. Right now, we have a trans, or we have a, excuse me, a perfusion uh, care model. So our perfusionists become indentured servants when patients go on ECMO. They are in the hospital 24 hours a day. So they somehow figure it out and they get it done. It is the safest way to take care of the patients. It is not the most economic way to take care of the patients. It's pretty expensive for the hospital, but we felt that that was the institutional commitment until we were busy enough until we felt that we could develop a circulatory support system primarily run by nurses where they can help run the cardio help systems and then have perfusionists on call for backup. So that is something that we'll drive for. And then uh, grow volume. Right now we are what I would call as an episodic program. We go through periods where we have people on, we go through periods when we don't have people on. Um, it is not the best way to maintain competency, although I think that has not really been our challenge. But as we continue to grow, you know, we have the opportunity to become what I would call a, 
kind of a, a mini referral center. Um, helps for overflow for our main ECMO program down in Orlando when they're at capacity. Also within some of the more rural areas that we serve, opportunity to help take care of those patients as well. This is what I do. Yeah, things go bad is what we do. You know, my favorite slides, my only slide, really. Um, so I'm gonna pause here and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have.